are just for this course. They have different topics. They have mechanics, electricity, and heat and thermodynamics all on the same sheet. This would never be true in class. In class, the ILDs are on one topic. Do you want to explain that? até que o aluno chegue na direção de onde ele quer. E o que ele falou é que o que nós vamos fazer agora não é You know what? Just just give them for now just give them um, give them this one. Just that. E quando ele faz isso na aula, é um tema específico, né? Não são temas variados, é mais para trazer uma amostra para vocês. Okay. I am giving you uh, each a prediction sheet. Um, these are results sheets. I won't give them to you now. It's not important to have this, but I want you to have a prediction sheet. Normally, the prediction sheet and the result sheet will be stapled together. Okay. No, no, that was. You must be sitting next to somebody. If you are sitting by yourself, then you will not be participating. So please sit near somebody. Okay, pessoal. Ele falou o seguinte: para todo mundo sentar com alguém, né? Porque, como ele estava explicando, é importante depois de fazer a previsão discutir, né? Para que ele vai falar certinho na hora certa. Okay? All right. Now, we will look at some demonstrations related to Newton's third law. Uh, and on your sheet, it says mechanics demonstration number one. Number one. Here is the demonstration. Uh, you can see the description. There is, whoops, go back. There is a heavy cart. It has lots of mass. There is a light cart, not as much mass. There are force probes on both carts. Oops, I have a pointer. Where's my pointer? Ah. Which one? off. Uh -huh. Oh, it's this way. <laughs> Heavy cart, light cart, force probe, force probe. Okay? Now, we will have a collision. I'll show you the collision. Yeah, you have to do it. No, no, no. Yes? Okay. The heavy cart crashes into the light cart. Uh, no, it's all right. I think it's okay. Okay? Please predict by comparing... Go back to the... Go back to this. To the sheet there. Yeah. Compare the force of the heavy cart on the light cart to the force of the light cart on the heavy cart during the collision. So please.
Okay, when you are making a prediction, you are not talking. You are making your own prediction. It's all right. Okay, when you're finished, look up so I can see. Okay, let's... Now what I want is for you to compare your prediction to your neighbor's prediction. Or if it's three people, it can be three people. It's okay. So discuss your predictions. If you don't agree, then see if you can reach an agreement on what the prediction should be. Do you want to say that? Yes, sir. That's better. I was saying Portuguese. What? I was saying Portuguese. Okay. Yes. Uh, pessoal, o que ele falou é o seguinte, para vocês conversarem, desculpa aí interromper já que vocês já ficaram exaltados aí, né? É para vocês conversarem o seguinte, se tiver diferença nas previsões, para vocês chegarem numa conclusão juntos, né? É, tentar pelo menos. Okay, I would like a volunteer to tell me what your group agreed on for the prediction. Volunteer. You can speak in Portuguese and Victor will translate or, or um, Tomas will translate. Volunteer. What is your prediction? Or, if you prefer, then tell us, my students would predict this. Do you want to? Yeah. Uh, o que ele disse foi o seguinte, para algum voluntário aí é, falar o que, que vocês concordaram na, na previsão, mas se vocês estiverem acanhados, pode falar assim, ah, eu acho que o meu estudante poderia fazer essa previsão. Ok? Ok. So, volunteer. No, why are you talking to him? You should be talking. Please. Please. S please. Yes, please. Step, stand, stand. I'm sorry, I, I, my ears are stuffed. Can you hear him? No, you have to speak louder. Turn, turn, turn. Yes, thank you. 
Bom, é que quando ele colocou aqui, a minha parte física já foi direto para demonstração, né? Como eu faço em sala, na verdade. Mas, é, mas acho que o meu aluno teria muita dificuldade. Você teria que pensar assim, bom, primeiramente, descrever a, a tua lisão. O que está acontecendo, se tem uma força, como é que... É, ele teria que chutar uma, um, uma força, como é que a força seria, dos dois casos. Describing it as well. Okay. I, I'm puzzled because all I all I asked was compare this force to that force. That's not a very complicated question. I my students would have no trouble answering that question. And the way they would answer it is the force of the heavy cart on the light cart is bigger than the force of the light cart on the heavy cart. Almost every student will answer that way. Mm. No problem. So I'm not, I don't understand. What is their difficulty? Well, it's because we all in the class, we see that they have many difficulties to understand the concept, effectively. So, they are more concerned with the formula, with the calculus quantitative, than exactly with the concept. Yeah. I'm not talking about momentum conservation. That's I didn't did I say anything about momentum? No. <laughs> uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, would your students um, understand uh, momentum conservation if they don't understand Newton's third law? No. <laughs> so this comes first. Nothing to do with momentum conservation, I don't think. É porque talvez, assim, eu, na verdade, uso essa a conservação para falar de terceira lei. Então, eu uso isso para falar que isso é uma consequência da segunda. Mas é a forma que eu trabalho. Uh, interessante, porque eu tive dificuldade. Porque, como, uh, pela minha formação, eu gosto de, demonstra de demonstração matemática, vamos dizer assim, teórica, né, quando você falou assim, eu falei, poxa vida, como é que eu vou pensar isso experimentalmente? Né, porque tu acha que é, é a... Can't teach the second law using the third law. And They're not the same law. They have, <laughs> if, uh, if you could teach the third law using the second law, then there would only be two laws. <laughs> In <laughs> fact, there'd only be one law. <laughs> the third law is very different. Anyway, this is not. I I I hear what you say, but I think I disagree, because the problem is not that your students can't describe. One force is bigger than the other. The problem is that you're getting them confused with momentum, and this has nothing to do with momentum. It has something to do with momentum, but this is more fundamental. É, é, talvez porque a minha aula é muito tradicional. Né? Na verdade, quando eu okay. quando eu uh, vi, o te, vi o o tema da, do, do mini curso, uh, a gente está sempre melhorando, porque porque a gente vê que mesmo você ter uma aula tradicional, você os seus alunos não aprendem muito. Você chega no final do seu curso, você sabe o que ele passa, mas ele não sabe conceito. Sim, eu entendo. É isso que eu I should not do that. It's not, imp it, it, all I asked 
when I ask for a prediction, all I ask is a prediction, not a discussion. Of course, we are, we are teachers. We, you are not my physics class. You understand, you, are, you, you teach physics. You te so, so you're not my physics class. I understand that. And these are important questions. I don't deny. But all I, when, we, when I ask for a prediction, all I want is a prediction. So how many, let me ask a different question. You will have to translate. I have two carts, and they are identical, same mass. So uh, sa both the same mass. Can you And I collide them like this. What will your students predict if you ask them, compare the force of this one on that to the force of this one on that? What will they predict? Equal? Yes? How many agree? Okay. Now we do this one. What will they predict, do you think? Which? Say, say. Say it in Portuguese. He said that the force of the one he is using would be bigger. How many think their students will say that? Okay. Here is, here is a problem. So this is what your students believe. So we do an experiment because what is, what is science about? We learn from the physical world. So we do an experiment. We do this experiment and we show the forces because we have force probes. What does it look like? Oops, sorry. You think so? Looks like that. Now, we do this experiment. Big one, little one. What does the graph look like? Same. So, I think students, if you ask them about forces, can understand that you're asking about forces. If you ask them about momentum and, and, and how momentum is related to Newton's third law, maybe they don't, they can't do it. But that's not what I'm asking. So, so please, when I ask you to make a prediction or what your students will predict, it's a prediction about this. Momentum comes later. Okay? Yeah. Ele falou que quando ele pede para fazer uma previsão, é isso que ele está querendo dizer, né? Que a parte de matemática vai vir depois, o momento vai vir depois, né? Okay? All right. Let's um Let's try another one. Oh, good. Okay. Now, this time, let me show you show you what this looks like. I have a force probe. And I have a block of wood. So actually go back to the... So I push the block of wood. I make it go faster, then move at a constant speed, and then slow down and stop. Okay? So, I want you to make two predictions. When the block is moving at a constant speed, how does this force compare to that force? 
When the block is speeding up, how does this force compare to this force? And also, how does this force compare to the frictional force between the block? Okay? You understand? So please, make your prediction. Individual prediction. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Can you (laughs) translate into Portuguese? (laughs) No, no. What didn't you understand? Here. Yeah, the block is on the table, so there's friction. Yes? Yep. And I'm going to push this so that first it speeds up, then it moves at a constant speed, and then it slows down. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. O movimento que ele está falando que vai acontecer com esse bloco é que ele vai aproximar esse esse bastão, vai encostar no bloco e vai começar a aumentar a velocidade do bloco. Depois ele vai manter o bloco numa velocidade constante e depois ele vai reduzir esse movimento aí até parar. acelera, mantém constante e depois diminui. E naquele ponto ali tem um extensor de força, né? No ponto de contato. So first we compare this this force and this force and then we compare this force and friction. Ele primeiro tem que comparar a força que que ele faz no bastão com a força que o bloco vai fazer no bastão. A, e depois comparar a força que ele está fazendo ali no bastão para empurrar com a força de atrito embaixo do bloco. Ok. Okay, please, when you're finished with your prediction, compare it with your neighbors and discuss. Quando vocês terminarem a previsão individual, então, pessoal, discutir com seus colegas e fazer aquela mesma, aquela mesma ideia, né? Discutir e tentar chegar num acordo. Okay, so 
volunteer when the when the block is moving at a constant speed actually let's go number 2 when the cart is moving at a constant speed compare this force to this force what do you think volunteer says the same Okay. Uh, how about comparing this force to the frictional force? What do you think they would say? Okay. Okay. Let me Yeah. All right. So we have uh the same or or this one is bigger and same for the friction. Although that this one is bigger than the friction. Okay. Now just one comment. This set of interactive lecture demonstrations is not the first one they have done. It's actually maybe the third one. And the first two are related to Newton's first and second laws. So by this point, most students believe that when something moves with a constant velocity, there is no net force, the net force is zero. So they would be more likely to say, to predict that this force and the friction force are equal. But, I, but your predictions are, are very likely for students who know nothing about, don't understand Newton's first law, okay? All right, let's look at the result. Uh, so here is, there's the block, and, oh, no. How do you get it to, oh, okay. So here we go. Speeds up, slows down. In the middle, constant velocity, all right? You want to do it, do it, can you do it again? Speeds up, constant, slows down. Okay, that's the motion. Okay, now here is, here are the measurements. Okay, can someone please describe what you observe? What do you observe when the middle part is where it's moving at a constant velocity? How do you comp what would you say about the two forces? Volunteer? What do you think? Do they look the same? Yes, equal equal forces. Okay, and uh, what about when it's speeding up the first part? Here. Equal, yes? What about when it's slowing down? Okay, can someone explain why? Why are these two forces, the force of my hand on the block 
and the force of my block on the hand, why are those always equal no matter how, what happens with the block, no matter how the block moves? Do you want to translate that? Can you? I don't think they can hear you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, o que ele falou é o seguinte: é, por que que, por que que essas forças são iguais quando está acelerando, quando está a velocidade constante e quando está reduzindo a velocidade no final, né? Tentar explicar por que que são iguais. Why? Volunteer? Porque há contato entre os dois corpos, não? So what law? He shows three. Newton's third law. Interactive pair of forces. They have to be equal and opposite. Always. No other possibility. Okay. So, volunteer. What about this force and the frictional force? Here. The block is speeding up. Compare. Can we measure the frictional force? No. But what do we imagine? If it's speeding up, this force compared to this force. This one is bigger than the friction because it speeds up. What about when it moves at a constant velocity? Equal. And what about when it slows down? Friction is bigger. But these two forces, the force of the hand on the block and the force of the block on the hand, are always what? Equal. Newton's third law. The other block and friction is Newton's second law. All right? Okay. Let's... Um, what does it look like if you have a large lecture, many students and you are doing interactive lecture demonstrations. I will show you a video, very short video. Uh, the person, the, the professor will speak in English, so you won't understand, but let me explain. This is a demonstration where there are two fans on the cart, one blowing this way, and one blowing that way. And those forces are equal and opposite. So the net force is zero. This is Newton's first law. We give the cart a push and let it go. And it goes at a constant velocity because it has very little friction. Do you want to? Daí ele falou que vai empurrar esse carrinho e vai deixar ele parar sozinho. E falou que tem bem pouco atrito, quase nenhum atrito nesse... É, ele vai continuar até parar, né? Com pouco atrito, exato. Ok. But what I want you to watch 
is the students. Watch what the students are doing during this lecture. Okay? No. Oops. How do you make it work? I can't. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start the fans up. Don't worry about it. Remember, stand still. And I'm going to give it a little push. Like that. And let it go. Your prediction is what is the velocity of the acceleration for that tank? Okay? Go ahead and do your individual shapes first, please. Students are making predictions. Okay, please turn to your neighbor. No discussion. Very noisy. So, very different from a normal lecture. In a normal lecture, the students are completely quiet and the professor is talking. In interactive lecture demonstrations, at some times, the students are very noisy. They are talking to each other. They are learning from each other. They are uh, comparing their predictions. It's very active. Okay. Of course. So, to design interactive lecture demonstrations, we must have a very simple, single concept experiments, and they must build on each other. We start with what the students know and we build on that. The students must trust the measurements. So we must do some very simple things first and then that they trust. So to show that a force probe really measures force, for example, and then we build on that. Many of our demonstrations that we normally do are too complex. Uh, students can't learn from them, as I told you before, but we could break them down into smaller pieces and help students to learn in an interactive way. How do we use interactive lecture demonstrations? we can introduce concepts. So, for example, Newton's third law, we can introduce it using this. We can review concepts. Or even sometimes in a laboratory, we can use them when a measurement is very difficult to to do it interactively rather than have students work and, and not do the measurement correctly. Okay. There is a book that has many interactive lecture demonstrations in it. It has prediction and results sheets. It has instructor's guides. It has notes to bring to lecture to remind you what to do. It has the eight-step process, suitable for framing. It's a joke, but... <laughs> but it's in English. 
So it is of very limited use to you. If you want to look at it, um, you can... Uh, where's a copy of... Here, give me the, first, no, the other one. On this sheet, number one at the bottom, it gives you the link. If you go to that link, you can download the whole book as a PDF. You can look at it. But, of course, if you want to use any of these, except for the ones here, they will have to be translated. Okay, let me talk about how do we sequence the teaching of mechanics in the ILDs. So, after kinematics, we begin with the law that is easiest for students to understand, Newton's second law. The idea that if you apply a net force to an object, you get a, con a constant force, you get a constant acceleration. So, Atwood's machine. So, the relationship between the acceleration and force with a constant mass. This is the easiest for students to understand. Then, we can add friction. Put a, f a friction pad on this cart, because the cart has very low friction. We add a friction pad, and we can explore the idea of net force. Two forces, applied force, friction force. Then, again, how do forces combine we can put two fans, one blowing one way, one blowing the other way, and see what happens. Finally, Newton's first law is the most difficult for students. Because as you said, most students think if something is moving, it must have a net force. But Newton's first law says no. If it moves at a constant velocity, then the net force is zero. So we do experiments like this. Another example of zero net force. Uh, you know about impetus. What is the word? Impu Forza de impulso. That students believe if you push and then it goes, it still has a force. But here, they pull and then let it go, and it keeps going. Again, Newton's first law. Um, then we can look at direction. If the force is this way and the object is moving this way, it slows down. If they're in the same direction, it speeds up. Fine, then, what is the relationship between F and... Be, I'm sorry, between acceleration and mass when the force is constant? Because F equals M, A. M and A. Okay? And then finally, the definition, number nine, the definition of the mass unit. If you apply one Newton of force to a one kilogram object, does it accelerate at one meter per square second? And we can do that. We can do an experiment and measure that with the motion detector and a force probe. 
Okay. In, in the book, there are ten sets of mechanics ILDs. Kinema- first one, kinematics, body motions. It's a motion detector, and the students walk in front of the motion detector and see their graphs. Okay? Kinematics 2, motion of a low friction cart. Newton's first and second laws, cart with a force probe and applying forces to it. Newton's third law, the ones we just did. So collisions and pushing on a block. Vectors, looking at how vectors with a simulation how vectors add together. Projectile motion, looking at a video with video analysis of a projectile, a ball that's tossed. Energy of a car of a cart on a ramp. Uh, Same kinds of motions, but calculating the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the of the system and analyzing those. And momentum, looking at various collisions and conservation of momentum. And rotational motion. And then finally, some statics. Measurements, um, forces applied to an object, and rotational and uh, translational equilibrium. So those are the mechanics interactive lecture demonstrations in, in that book. Do students learn? So... The force in motion conceptual evaluation. I mentioned this yesterday. Um, On your sheet, so it is mentioned in these two papers, which you can download. And it is described in very much detail in number two at the bottom, which you can find in the American Journal of Physics, but not translated into uh, Portuguese. These two are translated for you, but this, this one is not. It has 47 questions. Um, And these are based on more open-ended research. Questions are asked in a number of different ways, so we understand better what students know. So we can uh, track the understanding of students as we go through the physics course. Let me show you uh, two sets of questions. So these questions are called the natural language questions. Um, There is a sled, and it's on ice, so there's no friction. And somebody can push the sled in various ways. They can push it this way. They can push it this way. And so there are... uh, Seven choices of the force, okay? And then the questions ask, which of these forces would keep the sled moving in the way that is described? So, for example, if the sled is moving at a constant speed, 
constant velocity, which of those forces? If the sled is speeding up to the right, which force? If the sled is speeding up to the left, which force? Okay? So that's the natural language questions. There's another set of questions called the graphical questions. This time the answers are in terms of graphs of force versus time. But the questions are the same. If it's moving to the right and speeding up, which, gra which force would produce that motion? Okay, so it's a very different context, graphical rather than words, but it's asking the same for the same information. Okay? So it's not a descriptive test. It's not a test where students are asked to give the name of something. It's a test where the students are asked to take basic principles and apply them to physical situations. Okay? To actually apply them, to actually show that they understand the concepts. Okay, I showed you these results yesterday. This is pre-instruction, post-traditional instruction, 8% gain. And after the students have done a, uh, three, three sets of ILDs on mechanics, the first three that I mentioned, the learning gain is 74%. So they learn very well. Ah, you have the book. This is the book. Oh. This is the book. It's a thick book. Anyway, you can download it if you want to see it. Yes? Yeah, in actuality, it's the same class because uh, the way that we did this is to do all of the traditional instruction first, then test, and then do some interactive lecture demonstrations, and then test again. So it's all the, it's the same students. Yes. Do you want? To, did you, do you want to translate his question and? It's okay, it's okay. Uh, the previous slide, can you see? The previous one, uh, the results. Maybe it's I've better if you, uh, do you understand? It's better if you speak in Portuguese uh, so everybody understands and then he can tell me what uh, you said. No, but with the microphone. Ok, sorry. Uh, no slide anterior, eu queria saber o que você uh, quer dizer com o ensino tradicional. O que está sendo comparado? Lecture. Just lecture. Just, just speaking and writing equations and every... What? Uh, homework, yes, homework problems, but no laboratory, no laboratory for these students. Yeah. Yes, yes, yep, traditional, yes. Okay, okay. a few more ideas. Maybe ILDs look very easy um, because I have the... Uh, by the way, of course, 
with, when I do ILDs, I use real equipment. I don't show videos. As I said yesterday, I didn't want to bring equipment, but I, I uh, do real experiments with real equipment. But maybe it looks easy because these are very, these look like very simple experiments. But when you try to do ILDs, there are some serious ways that you can make a mistake. So let me just say to you, do not switch and become a lecturer. When you do ILDs, the information should come from the students who are observing the experiment. If they don't give the answer you like, then ask them questions. But don't lecture. If you lecture, then it's, it's again, traditional instruction. You are telling them. Students learn much better by themselves when they have correct information from the physical world than if you tell them. Second problem. We, are phys we know physics. We look at a graph and we might see a little bump or a little thing that looks not exactly right. Students don't notice these things. They don't care. If I spend my time telling them, oh, this bump is because the motion detector uh, had a little blip, <laughs> little mistake, they will lose their attention. Don't do that. Focus on the, th the things you're trying to teach, not these little details that don't make any difference to students. Let me remind you from yesterday, why do they work? Why do students learn? They learn because they are forced to consider what they know, what they believe, before learning something new. We cannot assume there is nothing in the student's head. The students have ideas. They must know what they are before they can change them. When students predict, defend their prediction, and write down their prediction, they want to know the result. And they think that they are correct. When they see that they are not correct, they want to know why. And this is the moment when they can learn. They are surprised. Why are these equal and opposite? They don't, they, they are surprised. And, but if they discuss it and realize this is what Newton's third law means, they're equal and opposite, always, then they can learn. So they are constructing their knowledge from their observations. And that's what scientists do so they are being scientists. Okay? All right. Questions? Any questions? Yes. Alô? Yes. Esse método, ele ele demora um pouco mais do que o tradicional para poder ser para poder ser passado, porque o um grande problema que, que a gente tem aqui no Brasil, não sei se no mundo todo, é a questão do tempo, porque as escolas exigem que muito conteúdo seja passado em um pouquíssimo espaço de tempo. Ok, so, when I teach my physics class, I have three lectures each week. One lecture, 
I do ILDs. Only one. Yes, I do six ILDs. I cover the concepts that are difficult for the students to understand. But after I do the ILDs, they understand them. So the rest of the week, I can build on that. You want to tra translate? Wait, you should translate first. Please. He's okay, but... No, no, for everybody. Yes. Ele falou que dá três aulas semanais e uma delas é com essa perspectiva aí. As outras são aulas regulares, né, de resolução de exercícios. Se foi isso que eu entendi mesmo. Né? Uh, 50 minutes. 50 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well... <laughs> So maybe you have to adjust. Two hours per week. Yeah. It's not enough time. I, yeah, I know. It's not enough time. But it's better... Okay. It's better for the students to understand some part of physics, and maybe not all of physics, than to not understand any physics. Okay. Ele falou que é melhor os alunos entenderem uma parte da física do que não entender nada de física, né? Yeah. É, eu queria saber se, é, se esse método aí é usado tanto no ensino superior quanto no ensino médio nos Estados Unidos. Um, we developed this strategy for college, but there are many high school teachers who use this type of strategy or this exact strategy. So it's appropriate for both. But realize in the U.S., if students take physics, they usually take it in their last year. They don't take it every year. They take it in their last year. Uh, um, and so the difference between a high school senior and a college freshman is very little. They're pretty much the same. We like to say, uh, I try a joke, <laughs> the difference between a high school senior and a college freshman is a suntan. <laughs> they are lying on the beach during the summer between. That's the only difference. So, do you understand? Okay. All right. So, é, ele falou que é usado tanto em ensino médio quanto em ensino superior lá, né? E ele falou que tem uma curiosidade quanto à, à física lá do ensino médio, que não é como a gente aqui, que o aluno tem as, desde o primeiro ano, né? Ele, ela acontece só no final, no, no último ano do ensino médio. Ele vai, o aluno vai ver física, né? Isso. E também é uma questão de escolha, né? No high school, no último ano. E ele falou então que a diferença de um aluno de último ano de ensino médio para um aluno de primeiro ano de faculdade, ela acaba sendo o que ele falou, a piada, né? É uma, é um bronzeado. <risos> ok. Another, another question. É, aqui no Brasil, a física já é ensinada para alunos de 14 anos. Eu queria saber se esse aluno já tem maturidade para esse tipo de, de aula. Né? Well, I'm not an expert on uh, cognitive psychology, so I can't... There are, there are different stages in children's lives when it's more appropriate to teach more sophisticated things. I don't know, and I suspect there's not so much difference between a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old, except that a 14-year-old 
is much less sophisticated and much as a student. So it, I, I don't, I think it's, it's harder for them to learn more difficult things because they're not used to doing that. In the U.S., uh, we have something called physics first. So there are a number of experiments where they teach physics earlier, but generally those courses are more conceptual than, than mathematical. Um, so um, I'm not sure that a 14-year-old can't learn from... I, I believe a 14-year-old can learn from these types of demonstrations because these are conceptual. They're not... They're not quanti... They're not... The, the, the representations are quantitative. Graphs, that might be a problem. But the ideas are conceptual. So I think they could work. Então, o que ele falou que ele não é especialista em psicologia cognitiva, mas ele imagina que cada idade mesmo tem um desenvolvimento de, de algumas habilidades diferentes. Só que ele acredita que de um aluno de 14 anos para um aluno de 16, que é a média do, do final do high school, não teria muita diferença, a não ser a própria maturidade que o aluno vai adquirindo com mais anos de estudo. né? E ele falou que tem um projeto aí nos Estados Unidos chamado Physics First, né? Física Primeiro, que vai trazer alguns experimentos de física, alguma a informação sobre a física para alunos mais jovens. Só que com essa perspectiva de mais conceitual e menos matemática. Another. Então, aqui aqui no, no Brasil, o nosso ensino desde desde o básico, ele é um ensino muito passivo. O que significa isso? A gente as aulas são todas ministradas, o professor falando, e o aluno ele não participa muito já desde o início. Ele já é acostumado a não, a não discutir, não participar. Então, quando a gente aplica um método novo desse, aos 14 anos, a gente sente muita dificuldade na aderência dos alunos, a participação deles. Né? E é uma coisa que, que pesa muito no professor. Existe alguma tática para a gente poder contornar isso? Well, this is true. This is true in the U.S. Even for for college students, they have, for many years, been lectured to. It's not uh, easy for them to be asked to make predictions. This is it's different. Most teaching in the U.S. is done in a traditional way. So, the way that you do it is that. Number one, you explain why are you doing this? Because there's so much research in physics education that has shown that students learn much better in this way than in the traditional way. So you tell them, we are going to ask you to make predictions and to discuss the physics because we know from research that you will learn better if you do that. That's one thing. Explain why you're doing it. Second, give them credit for doing it. So, uh, you know, it's different in high school. In, in, a, in a college in the U.S., you have a lecture, you have 200 students. On any day, maybe... 50 students don't come to lecture. If they don't come to lecture, they won't learn from traditional instruction and they won't learn from this instruction. If they're not there, they won't learn anything. So I give them one point. I say, for this course, 
you have a total of 100 points. I will give you one point if you come and write predictions. So there's an incentive for them to be there. In high school, they must be there, I think. So that's, that doesn't work. But, um, and then the best incentive for students is that when you give them a test, there are questions on the test that they can answer better because they did this. You give them conceptual questions. I guarantee if you do ILDs and you a ask questions, conceptual questions, they will answer them better. They will understand better. Students will notice, oh, I could answer those questions because I did interactive lecture demonstrations. They will like them. They will say, the best thing in your course is interactive lecture demonstrations. I, this is, you know, at the end of a course in the US, we have a student evaluation. They have to comment. What did you like about the course? What did you not like about the course? My students, they always say they like interactive lecture, lecture demonstrations. Why? Because they do better on the tests. That's why. So that's the best incentive. Is, OK? Bom dia novamente. Meu nome é Alberto. Eu quero saber se, no sentido de dar incentivos, vocês, sua equipe já trabalhou com sala de aula invertida, Flipped Classroom. E se trabalhou, quais foram os resultados? Serviu, não serviu? With what? Flip Classroom? Ah. Uh, I have not. I believe that the idea of, do you know what flipped classroom means? Flip, it, it means that you have students do work at home and you, uh, such as watch short lectures online, do simple exercises, answer conceptual tests. And then when they come to class, you know what they understand and what they don't understand. And in class, you do active learning on the things that they don't understand. Right? Okay. I believe this is a very excellent idea. Um, I don't teach anymore. I, re I am retired from my university. If I were still teaching, I would try this. And a number of people have gotten very great success by doing this. But you have to be careful that you are very clear what they should do at home, what they should do in class, and how these work together. It's a lot of work, but I think it is the best, a very, very good idea. My only contact with that, as I mentioned yesterday, this little IO lab device. The people who developed that device are very much into flipped classroom at University of Illinois. And they want this device so the students at home can do experiments as, at, at home. And then when they come to class, they've already done experiments. That's what they want. And I'm working on that project. But but I've never taught a, I've never taught a class with a flipped classroom. I think it's a very good idea. Bom, só para se alguém ficou com alguma dúvida nessa parte, ele falou que o flipped classroom é uma maneira que você estuda em casa é, alguns materiais e você só vem para a aula para tirar algumas dúvidas que ficaram, né? E ele falou que, como ele já está aposentado, ele não trabalha com, com esse tipo de aula, ele não trabalhou com esse tipo de aula ainda. Mas que ele está ajudando um pessoal da Universidade do Illinois, que já está fazendo esse tipo de trabalho, que quem foi na palestra de ontem, ele mostrou um, um robozinho lá, né, o, que ele usava para fazer algumas demonstrações. 
e ele falou que esse pessoal, a ideia é fornecer para os estudantes da universidade, para eles fazerem os experimentos em casa, com esse robozinho, e só vir para a sala de aula para tirar as dúvidas. Ele falou que essa equipe de Illinois está bem mais desenvolvida nisso que ele, que ele conhece, que ele participa do grupo, mas que nunca trabalhou. Mas, se tivesse na ativa, provavelmente, ele, ele iria é, tentar descobrir mais sobre essa metodologia, que ele falou que, na concepção dele, ela pode ser muito positiva. Ok, let's do, let's do one example. Oops, went away. Let's do one example of electric circuits. Uh, let me let me just share with you. Um, some research some research that was done by uh, the group in physics education at the University of Washington and if you are interested the last reference number three is this research uh, And you can, so unfortunately, again, it's in English, but here's a summary of the research. What do students believe about electric circuits? And these are some things that naive students, some problems that naive students have. So, number one, they don't understand the concepts of current potential difference, energy, and power. In fact, they confuse some of these as the same thing. They've never connected a circuit. They don't understand a closed circuit. They don't understand you have to have a complete circuit. They believe that the direction that the current flows or which element comes first makes a difference in the circuit. They believe that current can be used up. Of course, something is used up. Energy is used up. Energy is dissipated. But they believe current is used up. The current goes away. They believe that a battery is a constant source of current. Uh, so they don't understand that a battery is a provides a constant potential difference. They don't understand series and parallel connections. If they see two resistors like this, they say they're parallel. No matter how they're connected, they are parallel. And they tend to focus on the quantity, the number of circuit elements, not the quality, not how they're connected. So they have all these difficulties. Very bad conceptual difficulties. So I'm going to skip just to tell you that we have current and voltage probes. We have an interface, of course. I'm going to skip this. You don't need to know this. Uh, just to say that when we designed ILDs, we use batteries and flashlight bulbs, but, and students can observe how bright the bulbs are, but they also can measure the current and voltage at various places in the circuit at the same time. And so we will, the ones that I show you are using these probes but you could also do them with meters. You have to change the wording a little bit, but meters could be used. So, on your sheet, you have this diagram. You see, you have one light bulb, it's connected to the battery. There's a second light bulb, and there's a switch. So, I want you to predict What will happen to the brightness of bulb 
D when you close the switch. When the switch is closed, compare the brightness of bulb D and the brightness of bulb E. And when the switch, and compare the current through the battery when the switch is open and the switch is closed. So please, make your predictions. Individual predictions. Individual. We have fifteen minutes. Fifteen? Oh, <laughs> this is wrong. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, when you're finished predicting, then please discuss your predictions with your neighbor. No, I'm I'm okay. If it's if it's right here, yes. But yes, the water fountain is there. Oh no, it's a it's all right. Oh here. Yeah, it's good. Okay, it's good. It's difficult. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, can I have a volunteer to tell me either your prediction or what your students, what you, actually, let's, let's, let's have a volunteer tell, tell us what you think your students will predict. What do you think your students will predict for this? Volunteer? So, what will happen to the first bulb when you close the switch? Well, I think the students would predict that the intensity would diminish. Okay, he says students will predict that the intensity of bulb one, of bulb D, D, D. will diminish. Diminish. Okay, the second one. How about what will they say about the two bulbs? Compare the second prediction. The same. Same, okay. And I, what think they would, I think they would say the same. Same. And what about the current through the battery, before and after? The, the last prediction. The last prediction. I don't know what the students would say. Okay. Anybody, anybody think? What, what will students say? They don't know. Okay, but, but students, you know, 
students often are, have some idea and they will be willing to say something. So what do you think, what would be their impulse? What would they say? Well, if they well, they only have three possible answers, right? If you're asking them to compare both currents, <laughs> it's it's greater, equal, or smaller. I think they, there's a chance they might say that it's greater. The okay. current through the berries is bigger than the current through the lamp E. Okay. Any? I I think I think from experience, many students will say that it's the same, because. They think that a, a, a um, battery, it puts out a constant current. That's what it does. That's what they think. They don't understand what a battery does. By the way, I should have said that maybe, I think it says there, these bulbs are, are perfect bulbs, and it doesn't make any difference for this, and the battery has no re resistance, because if the battery has an internal resistance, it will be a little bit different. Yes. É, se você traduz para ele depois. É, primeiro, eu, eu gostei desse experimento, mas eu faria só o primeiro, a bateria e a lâmpada, para poder entender como é que o aluno entende como funciona uma corrente é, elétrica. E aí eu acho que aí daí eu dar, teria como prever o que, que ele pensaria, né? Entender como é que o aluno pensa, como é uma corrente elétrica. Provavelmente ele pensa como se fosse um fluxo de água passando, e aí gasta. E aí a, a corrente chegaria menor lá na, na bateria. Ok. What? Só uma lâmpada e uma bateria primeiro, antes de fazer esse, esse experimento, para entender como é que o aluno vê como é que é a corrente elétrica. Yeah. This is not the first demonstration. You can look in the book. You'll see there's, there's a bunch of demonstrations. Yeah, this is not the first one. Sorry, I should, have, I should have said that. I should have told you that. Okay. How do we... Oh, sure. Bom dia. Eu queria saber se existe algum material que o professor utiliza para tornar isso mais concreto, mais observável, a eletrodinâmica da corrente elétrica. Porque hoje em dia a gente tem vários aplets que animam esses circuitos. Ele fica uma coisa muito abstrata, um desenho. Eu gostaria de saber se o professor faz esse tipo de trabalho associado à, à metodologia de ensino. Uh, let me answer after. Let's do this and then, then I'll answer. Remind me. Okay. Okay. By the way, many students, he said they will predict that the first bulb is dimmer. Is, is dimmer because, and the reason why they think that it will use up, uh, there will, each, each bulb uses up some current so there won't be enough current to light both of them. Some, many students, you, if you ask them the second one, they will say bulb D is brighter than bulb E because the current goes to bulb D first, it gets used up, and there's not in, as much to go to bulb E. Uh, so these are the types... Here, I can. These are the types of... Whoops. Problems. All right. Let's. Um, okay. So here is the circuit. Battery, bulb. The bulb is bright. Second bulb 
switch. You can't see the switch. The switch is just two wires. Okay, you, I, I don't know. You just touch it? Yeah. Oops, no, no, no. You can't do it anywhere. It has to be over the <laughs> switch. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, got Here. it. Okay, got it. Okay, watch. I close the switch. I open it. I close it. I open it. Okay? So we, do, we only have a few minutes left, so I won't ask, I won't go through all the steps, but, oops. All right. So what, so both bulbs are equally bright. The first one stays just as bright as it was. Sorry, can we just have, just, I just want to have the, there. Okay. The second, the, they're both equally bright, we saw. And if you make a graph, there's the current through lamp D, and here's the current through the battery. And you can see that it becomes twice as big. Okay? And so then you can, of course, ask students to explain what, what model is there for this? Why would that be? So clearly, and again, I'm, I'm explaining to you. You should never do this, but we only have a few minutes. Of course, that uh, uh, each bulb um, is connected directly to the battery, and they need so much current, yes? So we must have twice the amount of current. There are two paths. Okay? Um, but this is not easy for students at all, of course. And um, in answer to your question, I'm not sure, while I would love to have some analogy that made electric circuits, what's going on in an electric circuit, clearer to students, I'm not sure that the, that the the usual analogies make it easier. The usual analogy is to talk about wa uh, water flow. I, students don't understand water flow, so why will water flow help them understand circuits? I don't, think, I don't think that helps. I don't do that. I find that when we do a number of exercises like this, and maybe there are simulations that do similar things, and we do them in an interactive way, that students at least develop a model for a circuit that makes sense of these observations. And then you can go on and, and, and show how the mathematical equations agree with what they observed. Because you know, if you try, if this experiment, oops, yeah, the one we just did, if you try to take Ohm's law and the parallel addition of resistors to figure out what will happen, it's not so easy. Most students try to do that. They see a circuit. All they know is Ohm's law and 1 over R equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. It's not easy. It's better for them to, to figure it out in their heads and then look at the equations. Sorry. This. Yep. É que o problema de usar analogia com os circuitos de água, né? É que os alunos acabam achando que a fonte é, que a bateria é uma fonte de corrente. So I don't, I don't ever, I don't like that analogy. I don't use it. I don't use that in my class. So maybe that's not a good answer to your question. All I can say is, yes, you're in charge. You can make it come. 
é, o David, a gente tem trabalhado com eletricidade há muitos anos, e uma coisa que eu já, já notei várias vezes, os alunos realmente têm muita dificuldade de, dessa questão da fonte, da corrente que sai da fonte. E quando tem dois resistores em paralelo, dois em série, eles acham que a corrente sai, uma certa corrente I, I sobre dois vai para o primeiro, I sobre dois vai para o segundo. Eles têm dificuldade de entender, como ele falou, essa noção de fluxo. Porque eles não só não entendem a questão do fluxo da corrente elétrica, mas eles têm dificuldade de fazer essa analogia de que a corrente... Porque a gente sempre fala para eles, a corrente é um fluxo, uma coisa que, se você estiver no século XVII, no século XVIII, você não sabe o que é esse fluxo, é um fluido misterioso. Mas eles têm dificuldade, eles, mesmo assim, eles acham que a corrente, quando passa por dois resistores em série, ela divide e vai e, como, como se fosse um circuito em paralelo. Né? Para explicar por que, que a corrente, por que, que a lâmpada brilha menos quando está em série. Não. <laughs> oh, yes. No. By the way, of course, we do series circuits first before parallel in these demonstrations. Yes. Well, I will speak in Portuguese. One of the difficulties that I see in analogy é que circuitos hidráulicos, a resistência hidráulica é o próprio condutor. Em circuitos elétricos, os resistores estão muito bem definidos e os condutores são, em uma ótima aproximação, condutores ideais. Então, sempre num circuito, elétrico, num circuito hidráulico, a resistência está distribuída. Não existe um resistor hidráulico. download it online so you can see the rest. I just want to show you one thing that I really like um, and which is very different, I think, and that is when we teach uh, heat and thermodynamics, in thermodynamics we talk about heat engines, but there are Bef there are no, or there are, there are not many good examples for students to see really what is a heat engine. What do you mean by a heat engine? I mean, we talk about Carnot's law, Carnot's, Carnot efficiency, uh, and so on, the laws of thermodynamics, but what is a heat engine, really? And this is a demonstration that is very simple. Um, this is a syringe, a glass syringe. Yes, you say in... It has very, very low friction if it is clean. You should... Here is a uh, flask with air in it, and here is a pressure sensor. You see on top of the syringe is a mass. This is a mass lifting heat engine. If I take the flask and I put it in the hot water, then the mass goes up. It's lifted. Um, go ahead. Vai subir, vai levantar o peso. 
then I've lifted the mass, I can remove it. Then I can put the flask in the cold water. The syringe plunger comes down. Then I can put a new mass. And I go around again. So it's a cyclic engine. Goes through a cycle. You could think in a factory that uh, puts, uh, makes cans of food, cans of corn, that here's a can, they have to lift it up to put it on a, on a truck. So they have an engine, it lifts the can up, they put it on the truck, and then it goes down, it lifts up another can, okay? Okay, because I have a pressure sensor, I can measure the pressure, and because I have a syringe with markings, I can measure the volume. So there's a set of interactive lecture demonstrations on this. I won't show you the details, but here is the cycle of the engine. Pressure versus volume. And by the way, if you look at this, you see that we have, as, as the mass goes up, we have nearly constant pressure. We say isobar, right? Because the pressure is caused by the weight and the atmospheric pressure. When you remove the mass, it's very quick. So it's adiabatic. When you put the, the flask in cold water, it's an isobar again, constant pressure, and then another adiabatic process. So that is the cycle. And of course, you, in the software, you can measure you can do an integral and measure the work that's done. That's not necessarily so important. But, but here students can see, here is a real engine. It lifts a mass. And here is a PV diagram. That's what we're talking about. I don't think many students in an introductory course have any idea what we are talking about when we say that. But here they can actually see it. So I like this very much. I did not invent this. Uh, actually, Priscilla Laws from uh, one of my colleagues uh, discovered that you could do it. And by the way, that syringe, it only costs about $20. It's very cheap. It works very well. The volume, you can, you, you can uh, read the position of the, of the plunger and then add the volume of the flask, which doesn't change. So it's the volume of the flask and the tube and the amount of gas, the volume in the, in the syringe. 
You have to, this is set up in the software, so you put it in manually. You read it and you put it in. Yeah. You could do, have a motion detector that measured the position and automatically did it. But I don't like that so much. So, yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very, it agrees very well. And if you want to calculate the efficiency, you could, you could um, calculate, this is more complex, not simple concept. Use the specific heat of the gas to calculate how much heat was put in and how much heat came out and calculate the efficiency and it's very small, you would imagine. It's very, very small. I don't remember. One hundredth of a percent, one thousandth of a It's a very, very small number. But you could calculate it. Okay. I'll, I, th I should be done, yes? Or if, if I have two more minutes, I will do conclusions. But Okay, conclusions. Yes, I will be here. Yes. Of course. Of course. Okay. So quickly, conclusions. Um, so the eight-step ILD procedure is research-validated strategy for improving conceptual learning in lecture classes, even large lectures, by making the learning more active. ILDs require only one set of equipment, which is nice. You don't have to have small groups, many sets of equipment. You, and, and many ILDs can be done without computer-based tools, although many of them use computers because we find you can do things better. And as I said, all of these materials are in that book uh, so you can see what, what we've researched, what we've developed, but again, if you want to use them with your students, they will have to be translated. So uh, anyway, so that's it. Um, end of the course. Oops. Uh, just these are my children. My daughter is a psychologist and a violinist. My son is a physics major. Amazing. <laughs> and also a pianist. So that's the end. Thank you. And if you came in late, you should take one of these so that you have the references. And you can find the references on, online. Oh, yes. I, if you want, these are results sheets. I'll put them outside, but because... It's not important. It looks exactly like the, like the um, prediction sheet. Oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, and thank you for contributing. Thank you.